one and all, welcome in week two. This week we're going to focus on building, validating, modifying personality measures. This week will help you to start with your psychometrical project. So uh, let's start with a brief reminder. Uh, please make sure that this week you are able to start working uh, in your teams. Your tutors should uh, provide you information about your groups uh, today. And uh, thus, uh, after watching clips for today, please make sure that uh, all the homework can be done and you are fully prepared for taking uh, work groups on Thursday. So, if you have your team, first of all, select a questionnaire that uh, is a part of pre-selected set that you can find in files uh, in week one on Canvas. And, uh, of course, after watching this video clip, start working on your contextualization. In this uh, uh, week, uh, in this uh, clip, I will explain what doesn't mean contextualization and how we can justify this process. Why does it basically make sense to uh, contextualize personality measure that later on can be used for um, personal selection. If you are done with this part, if it's uh, fine, you think, you can submit a file with contextualized items by Canvas as an assignment. So you can find a link to this assignment uh, below in the description of this uh, clip. Or you can uh, just go to Canvas and uh, find it yourself. Uh, agenda for today, uh, we're going to focus on uh, criterion validity in uh, human resource. Also, that's the second part of the lecture, we're going to uh, think about yeah, what we can do, how we can build and develop uh, methods uh, with the focus on personality measures. Uh, and that would be uh, followed by a part related to planning validation. So uh, I'm going to discuss a part where I will explain how research can help practice to come up with the best possible uh, personality measures. And we'll finalize uh, uh, this uh, week uh, lecture uh, with item analysis. And those elements will be sep separated into three video clips. Okay, let's move on. Probably you remember this graph that I presented in uh, one of the video clips uh, in the previous week. It describes a situation where we try to predict work performance or job performance based on a specific test score. So we measure it uh, and later on we um, check what's the level of job performance. So we try to make a prediction based on test score. Let's say if you take into account conscientiousness, one of the most prominent personality measures in the work context, probably would expect that the higher in conscientiousness, the higher would be uh, work performance. In the textbook, you can find a really nice description of uh, how we can measure work performance. You can find there that we can distinguish between job-specific indicators for instance, uh, that can be a number of sold insurance, if uh, that's important for a specific person job or for a specific job itself. Or, for instance, that could be customer satisfaction. So, uh, just to mention a few. On the other hand, we may also indicate general aspects of work performance. Typically, that's effort. So, if an employee makes an effort related to job tasks that we can uh, say, yeah, this person is doing well. This person is a good employee because he or she um, does a lot to perform uh, his or her job. Of course, um, those general indicators, um, uh, the list with general indicators can be longer. Effort is uh, uh, one of those. 
and we can think that yeah how we can use personality uh, to predict um, this aspect why personality is relevant at work on one hand we may think it can help us to predict those job uh, specific indicators on the other hand uh, also we may think maybe uh, it helps us to predict this general indicators of work performance to discuss that we need to take a look at two aspects so first of all at work what is important is that what an employee can do and on the other hand how an employee does the work so as you see we have two possible aspects of what is relevant at work Personality is related to uh, the, the latter, to the second aspect. Because based on the personality, we can predict how an employee, for instance, approaches a task, uh, interacts with each other, uh, with colleagues, um, whether he or she is a team player or not. As you probably remember from the reading uh, of the textbook, there has been studied quite extensively what's the relationship between personality and job performance. A number of meta-analyses uh, took into account different aspects, different uh, job uh, performance. In those meta-analyses you can find two types of coefficients. One is uncorrected and the second is corrected. Let's take a look at the first one. Uh, in a meta-analysis by Barrick and colleagues, they found that there was a positive relationship between conscientiousness and job performance. On one hand, the uncorrected value was 0.10, the corrected value was 0.23. The prior was uh, very close, it's the actual value of a small effect size. The latter, 0.23, is pretty close to mean effect size. So, which one to interpret, you may ask. On the other, what's important is that corrected values, they take into account number, uh, number of problems, number of uh, errors, uh, low reliability. So, typically, we do interpret the corrected values. So, based on this meta-analysis, we can conclude that consciousness is uh, well related to job uh, performance. So the effect size for the relationship between consciousness and job performance is 0.23, so almost medium effect size. What is important, that takes into account all job roles. So it's across multiple types of job roles. Really uh, important result. On the other hand, it's something that usually happens when we select personnel is that we not only use one specific instrument, one method, let's say personality. We do interview, we also may use um, tests for capacity. Then you can ask a question, okay, what's the incremental validity over other selection tools? And depending on trait that is measured depending on the questioner that is used uh, that varies between 5 and 30 percent so it's quite high it can be really small 5 percent of incremental validity is really small on the other hand 30 percent it's quite substantial so it depends you may say but still personality what uh, when we discuss uh, incremental validity it's pretty important Besides this general aspect, when we take into account what's the relevance of personality for job performance, we always need to take into account what kind of uh, criteria we uh, measure. As you probably remember from the previous week, we may have three types of criteria. And also, what is even more important, depending on when we measure specific criteria, we may face 
different dynamics within each employee. Uh, this example shows that there is a substantial difference between employee A and B in how they develop specific ability that it's important for job performance. Depending on the person, we may get completely different patterns, different predictions if we would use personality. It's also really important that also to some extent can explain why this relationship between personality traits and work performance is never high. Okay, let's move on to the major part of uh, week two. We're going to focus on the use of personality measures and improvements, what is more important, of uh, questionnaires for personal selection purposes. Personality measures were widely criticized for multiple reasons. In a seminal paper published in 2007, they provided multiple arguments. So, for instance, they've uh, mentioned that basically validity of personality tests is low or it was shown that self-reports can be biased. So, um, if we would like to publish good results, uh, if we want to use something substantial for prediction of job performance, self-reports should be avoided. And thus, since we, let's say, reject self-reports as a good method to measure um, some dispositions or uh, variables that can be used to predict work performance, then future research should focus on alternatives. In this week, you will see one of the alternatives, which is situational judgment tests. Okay, we know that personality measures can be widely criticized. So, researchers were trying to improve that and were trying to do something with the existing measures. So, first of all, they focused on reduction of faking. We know that uh, when people provide self-reports, they may fake the results for multiple reasons. So, this table, it shows different methods to reduce faking. So, one of the methods was giving participants a warning that their uh, responses will be investigated and uh, faking can be uh, found. Also, another method was to ask uh, uh, candidates to provide examples. So, if they claim that they would behave or typically they behave in a given situation, then uh, they were also requested to provide uh, examples. Uh, also, to reduce faking, uh, computer methods uh, were used, faking scales also. They were trying to see whether measuring reaction times uh, is a good method for uh, reducing uh, faking. Uh, and finally, uh, they've used ipsative or semi ipsative tests that require uh, selection between more descriptive responses, not just between 1 and 5, or uh, responses scale were not Likert scale, but there were more descriptive, um, requiring more thinking, more effort, more consideration over what's an uh, uh, accurate response regarding specific reactions of a specific person. So let's focus on warning first. So if uh, candidates uh, were given a warning, there was a pretty nice increase in uh, validity. As you see here, uh, based on this uh, data uh, from a paper by Dwight and Donovan, they found that uh, giving a warning decreases faking. On the other hand, if participants do not take that into account, there is no decrease in faking. So if some people, they will just not take that seriously, uh, there will be no effect of warning. 
Another method that was investigated by Schmidt and Kunz, and they found that it can pretty nicely uh, reduce faking. The problem of uh, using this method is that uh, it may substantially reduce speed of the personal selection process. So if you, you would give up your candidate a personality test that consists of uh, 100 items, and then for each item or a few of them, you'll, uh, you'll uh, ask them to provide examples, you will end up with very, very long responses and uh, personal selection process will take a lot of time. Computer testing mm, that involves uh, an anonymity, working alone uh, and other aspects was proven to uh, even increase faking. So uh, it's not a good method. On the other hand, uh, you may think, oh, maybe we can use a specific scale, uh, like faking scales. And as you see, uh, based on studies by Stewart and his colleagues, uh, they found that faking scales do not properly measure faking. Regarding reaction times, you may think, okay, if we would measure personality um, responses to personality test and longer responses will indicate faking, but on the other hand, maybe short responses will indicate faking. And thus, they found that um, measuring reaction times and controlling for reaction times uh, does not give any effect. And finally, uh, asking um, participants to select um, between more descriptive uh, options. So instead of deciding either one or two or three, four and five, if uh, candidates are asked to select between two or three more descriptive options that indicate uh, potential options uh, for behavior, then uh, that can reduce faking. On the other hand, also increases predictive uh, validity. But if a person needs to respond not based on a Likert scale, but need to read multiple options, let's say two, three, or even more, that uh, increases time of the whole procedure. Since we know, based on this uh, table, that requiring more um, uh, descriptive responses or selecting between options that are more descriptive decreases faking. Maybe that's also a way to improve the whole process of using personality measures during the personal selection. Let's take a look at the data. In this table, you can find comparison between two different types of methods depending on trait that, that is measured and also depending on a domain within it was measured. In the middle part of the table, you have correlations between personality and partially ipsative methods, where responses are descriptive, require more consideration, more effort, you would say, from a candidate that takes part in a personal selection. On the right-hand side, you have uh, data for Likert type scales, where responses are given based on uh, scales from 1 to 5 or 1 to 7, 111, whatever. It's not really important, just Likert type. Uh, column on the left-hand side indicates trait and domain. So let's focus on those two major columns, partially ipsative and the uh, Likert scales. Let's take into account the first layer of the table, which is related to data for emotional stability. The highest correlation between partially ipsative was for domain of uh, supervising uh, other employees, lowest for was for uh, managerial uh, skills. 
it's not really important. What is more important in this case is the mean value, 0.11. If you would compare that uh, with the Likert type scale, you would see uh, 0.09, similar value. But if you take a look at the R1 for the partial ipsative and R1 for the Likert type, you would see that 0.20 is a corrected value and 0.10 again it's also corrected value. So for the Likert type scale, correction increased um, uh, validity just slightly for Likert type, but substantially for partially ipsative because the correction was from uh, 0.11 to 0.20. That's quite nice. Similar values were found for other personality traits. Let's move on, let's focus on another aspect. You may think that, okay, um, we can focus on general traits, but also we can take into account facets, or in other words, side dimensions. So there are some major differences between overalls traits and facets of those traits. Let's take a look at openness to experience and its sub-dimensions. In this study they found differences between general scale and facets for this scale. Let's take into account work performance first. As you see, general correlation between openness to experience and work performance was 0.10 for academic grades was 0.12. If you would take into account sub, uh, sub dimensions or facets, then you would see a slightly different pattern. Openness to experience consists of fantasy, aesthetics, feelings, actions, ideas, and values. So, correlation between fantasy and work performance was negative. The statics was also negative. Zero for feelings, but for actions, ideas, values was positive, the highest for ideas. So you can say that in this aspect of openness to experience, this effect size is medium, it's average, because it's close to 0.3. Similar pattern was discovered for academic grades. If you take into account openness to experience and academic grades correlation, 0.12, you would say it's a, me, uh, it's a low effect size, it's not medium effect size. But if you take into account ideas, again, you have medium effect size, 0.25. So similar pattern, fantasy negative, aesthetics negative, feelings negative, and so on. That's really important. So you can say that, yeah, if you would like to use personality for predicting work performance, taking into account sub-dimensions would be really relevant. Okay, so that's the way how we can improve predictions when we take into account sub-dimensions. On the other hand, we can take into account modifications of measures. One of the ways of modifying measures is to contextualize them. You can simply modify items. Let's take into account this set of general items. I start conversations, I start unpleasant tasks right away, I get easily disturbed, I have great ideas, I, I have little to say, I'm gentle. All those items could be used to measure personality traits. Let's say uh, we provide instruction and a response scale. And we can use each item to measure personality trait. But you can also think that maybe we can focus on specific aspects of this kind of behaviors. Does it really matter how I start a conversation at work? Does it really matter how I do it when I am friends? Or uh, I have great ideas when studying? Or does it really matter whether I have great ideas at work, if I do both? 
So maybe this sense contextualization can make it more specific and thus can make this measurement to be more precise in predicting potential performance. In many cases, it was found that this kind of contextualization, modification of items, by adding specific context can help to improve validity of measures. Let's take a look at how the process looks like. We have one general item. Let's say I demand a lot of for myself. So instruction is that instead of replying to this general item, a person is asked in this way. Answer the question or to the item thinking about your behavior at school. I demand a lot for myself. So a candidate is asked not to think about general situations or many situations, but instead of that focuses on demanding from himself or herself at school. Thus, a finalized modification can look like this. I demand a lot from myself at school. So a candidate can know situation. So situation is related to uh, the fact that it's required to uh, work a lot. And then responses to given examples. For instance, I demand a lot from uh, myself uh, at school. If description, the overall description of the situation is that it's really necessary uh, to uh, work on specific assignments uh, late at night. A scale that can be given to provide responses is like this. For instance, from 1 to 5, I disagree and agree. So as you see here, this modification is really simple. What happens to contextualize your items, you just copy items from the original scale, then you define the context. In this case, the context is school, but for your project, it should be job, something that is related to professional life. And you modify the item to reflect the specific context. So in this case, you would say, I demand a lot from myself at work for instance, or when doing my job. To make it easy for your respondent, you can, for instance, describe situation in detail. You may say, okay, that's your item. I demand a lot from myself at work and provide a description of a situation where and when that can happen. The description of the situation is not really necessary because um, that way may increase the time of responding to an item. So what is really fine is if you just um, modify uh, the items without providing the, the uh, description of a general situation. And of course, after modification of items, you need to provide a scale from 1 to 5 for instance, or from 1 to 7. Does it really make sense to contextualize questions? Yes, doing that makes a lot of sense because as you see based on this data and there's also more evidence, by contextualization you can heavily increase validity of questionnaires. This table it shows how contextualization increased validity of specific measures. In this case, they took into account um, 
supervisor ratings. Um, that was uh, um, that was provided um, based on uh, this specific uh, personality trait uh, framework. So uh, consciousness was taken into account emotional stability, extroversion, agreeableness and openness to experience. So as you see based on the first two bars uh, you see that there was an increase in validity because the white bar introduces uh, non-contextualized measure of consciousness and the second one introduces contextualized uh, consciousness. Those bars that indicate correlation between supervisor ratings, either non-contextualized or contextualized, and overall job performance. As you see for the other traits, those differences, especially for emotional stability, extroversion, and agreeableness, are very, very high. It's a bit lower for openness to experience, but in general, the data shows that if you contextualize your items, then you can heavily increase validity. So it's something the same that you are going to do for your group project. You will simply take items from one of the selected questionnaires. It can be, for instance, trade self-control and you simply modify the items by providing context. It can be at work, or at your job or similar. Please make sure that you stay in touch with your tutor and discuss these modifications later on. But that's what, what also found when studying effects of contextualization. This uh, table it shows effects of contextual performance. If performance was measured contextually. If when assessing the uh, job performance the context was specified in other words. Okay, let's take a look at elements of this table. So this table it provides information about the correlation between job performance overall, specific tasks, or specific context that is performing specific job. Then we have number of traits, emotional stability, extroversion, openness, uh, agreeableness, and consciousness. We have subcolumns, facets, middle or broad. Difference between facets, middle and broad is that for the facets we have aggregated effects related to the facets, then middle level of the factors. It's not really important, it's not really relevant for the sake of the argument for this presentation. Or we have broadly measured traits. So let's focus on the broadly measured traits and facets. So when specific facets of traits are taken into account. And then let's focus on the contextual, uh, contextual job. If we take into account facets and if we take into account contextual performance, as you see for emotional stability for facets we have 0.3 but for overall job performance and facets we have 0.23. So the difference is 0.07. You can conclude that if you take specific context, job context into account and facets thus, then you slightly increase validity. So you slightly better predict job performance, contextual job performance, based on emotional stability. The same benefits are for extroversion, for agreeableness, 
and for consciousnessness. The only difference is for openness to experience. And the question is that, yeah, how we could explain this? Think for a second and let's discuss that in a Q&A session. Also, what we can do with this results, we can compare results between facets and broadly measured personality traits. So for contextual job, we have difference 0.14 between facets and broadly defined. It's a huge difference because for facets, for emotional stability, we have average effect size or medium effect size for broadly defined is close to low effect size. For extraversion, the difference is even bigger. Take a look at the other traits, you will see similar trend. Maybe the difference for consciousness is not as high if you take into account facets and broadly measured traits, but still there is a small increase in validity. Now the final table that to some extent summarizes the um, presented results and also provides some additional aspects. What was found in research is that if, again, we would like to increase validity of personality measures, we also would need to perform personality-oriented job analysis. Uh, in this uh, brief slide, I just mentioned about this. Uh, it's really important that you take a look at uh, what was written in the textbook because they provide more information. What is really important at this point is to take into account that if job analysis is performed, then for some uh, for some variables for some personality traits, the increase can be substance can be substantial. On the other hand, if we would like to better understand relationship between personality traits and job performance, we would need to take into account mediators, variables that mediate between personality and job performance. For instance, that can be team level factors. Team performance is important, what happens between people, um, interactions between people, and researchers, they suggest that individual level traits are related for job performance if we take into account team factors. On the other hand, one of the advances is to create another version of personality trait measures. Something that requires more effort, more consideration, that is more ipsative, more descriptive. In this case, situation judgment test uh, can be contextualized and can be used in order to measure specific skills for a specific job and then use also for prediction of job performance. On the other hand, we can also use general domain knowledge uh, as situation judgment test to see whether we can measure some general, general abilities, general aspects, and then use that for predicting work performance. And finally, we can just stop using personality traits and we can use completely different methods, instrument, to measure personality related factors or something that can be used later on in predicting job performance. Like we can use games, we can use biodata, even DNA and different types of environment, like virtual environment, uh, in order to uh, predict job performance. As you probably know, uh, based on the Cambridge Analytica case, it's also to some extent possible to predict behavior of people 
based on their Facebook behavior. So for instance, if you're interested in predicting work behavior, you, you could use Facebook as a method to assess potential behavior of your job candidates. Later on in the course, Art Barnes will give a guest lecture on using games in order to measure personality and also in order to see whether we can use games to predict work performance. Stay tuned.